At first, I hated the whole idea. There are so many lies told, so many things done in the name of Africa that dominate the continent. The only thing you hear about Africa is the starving children, the poor health infrastructures, the crippling poverty surrounding the continent, or the existence of a common language that even Africans don't speak. If somebody showed you a bunch of half-dressed people from Tarzan movies, one would relate it to the African heritage. But one thing that stands out to me, that both me and the Lost Cafe would wish you would imagine, are the sounds. There are more than a hundred different languages, each one with its own candices and tones of intensities. And then, they all come together to form something completely new that borrows a little bit from each one. The way one minute we are yelling like it's the end of the world, and then the next, we are teasing strangers with the intimacy of old lovers. The ways everybody's business is everybody's business. The drums, that rhythm, I wish you could see it through my eyes. My name is Nina Miriam Dixon, Kiraya. Yes, part of my identity comprises of what you would call an African name. I happen to be born in a very beautiful country and a gifted continent. I was raised in the outskirts of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. I like to emphasize that Tanzania is not a city in the continent of Africa. Not to brag, but my country is home to Mount Kilimanjaro, Africa's highest mountain. It is densely forested, and three of Africa's great lakes are partly within Tanzania. To the north and west lies Lake Victoria, Africa's largest lake, and Lake Tanganyika, the continent's deepest lake, also known for its unique species of fish. And to the south lies Lake Malawi, also known as Lake Nyasa. Hailing from Dar es Salaam, the most populous city in Tanzania, I have witnessed the ways that culture, that peace has unified communities and cultures together. In several definitions of culture, factors such as ethnicity, language, religion, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, geography, and other sociological factors are involved. Now, a couple of months ago, I left Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And just like Prince Akeem played by Eddie Murphy, I too was coming to America. <laughs> Before boarding my flight at the Julius Nyerere International Airport, my mother reminded me that I needed to pack trousers, or pants, as they're called here in America, that I had left in the car since I was landing during the spring. I won't lie to you, excitement oozed through my veins because I was finally going to eat as much bacon and eggs for breakfast that I had wanted for approximately four years. While I moved to America with excitement, the move was a culture shock of extreme proportions. Honestly, I felt like I knew nothing about the United States. Even the unmissable American accents sounded far more extreme than what I had heard on TV shows such as I Curly, Henry Danger, or even Victoria's, my favorite childhood shows. For high school, 
I attended a culturally competent and diverse educational institution that employed the rigorous international baccalaureate diploma program. Cultural competence involves being conscious of one's own biases and how that may affect our interactions. In school, each individual contributed to an entity greater than themselves. In my second year, as cliche as this will sound, I distinctly remember a new first year student who arrived from so far away. For purposes of confidentiality, we will refer to them as Kili, short for Mount Kilimanjaro. Kili flew from a mountainous area slightly smaller than the state of West Virginia. This was their first time away from home, or even in an airplane. On campus, Kili didn't speak much, but they had a very infectious laugh. They had gone from being surrounded by the mountains to being surrounded by towns and villages, noise, probably strange food, and a language they didn't fully understand. You can imagine the culture shock that they were experiencing. Like many other students, while walking on the hallways to the dining hall, I greeted Kelly on a daily basis. But this one time, I asked for their Instagram account. Of course, before the end of the day, like many other people my age, I did a little bit of stalking. <laughs> I took some time to look at their pictures displayed on their Instagram account. A lot of their pictures were, and I quote, in the moment. So I thought, ooh, Kelly must be a very cool person. However, another side of me wondered where all the personality I had seen on, on Instagram was in reality. So I thought, Kelly must be a very shy person. The next time I saw Kelly walking on the hallways to the dining hall, I told my group of friends that I was going to invite Kelly to have dinner with us. At the table, Kelly, I still didn't see the complete side of Kili that I had seen on Instagram. But I witnessed more life and genuineness to their character. To be very frank, I was startled. Out of curiosity, my friends and I tried, and I quote, tried, to ask Kili about their home. So you like drive in any directions for like an hour and still be in the same area up in the mountains? Or even, so you're like the most educated up in the mountains? And many other ignorant comments and statements about their culture, customs, where they went to school, and the foods that they ate. I kid you not, a long sigh, which seemed to come from the very core of their body, expressed exhaustion. <sighs> a very wandering mind I have, I asked, is it difficult to explain? And Kelly responded, it is not like that until you actually live there. It is accurate to believe that if you were raised in a culture different to the one that you were born, if you were born in a culture different to the one that you end up living in, you're likely to feel some pressure to adapt and abandon familiar traditions. Fast forward to the earlier days of my arrival, I sighed at every single introduction on the lines of, hey guys, this is Nina and she's from Africa. Or questions such as, girl, so you like bilingual, so like you speak African? And statements such as, oh my God, that looks like a shirt I donated to Africa, where'd you get it? And even comments such as, uh, you know, I wasn't very good at geography in high school. I don't actually know where that is. When I said I was from Tanzania, no one had the idea that they were making me feel uncomfortable. However, instead of dwelling in shame, 
I tried to be patient with them and promised myself to be more accommodating. Now, I don't carry expectations that every single one of you in this room should know the exact location, radius, and size of every country in the world. But what I'm trying to say is, I can now entirely relate to the long sigh of exhaustion from Kili. I was once culturally incompetent, and now I am experiencing cultural incompetence from others. Introducing myself has become a geography lesson, and I have turned to become a spokesperson for an entire continent, something that Kili did not want to become. I have been afraid to share my individual experiences and stories, as I would soon be engulfed in opinions like, oh my god, Africans do that? And be required to defend the diversity of customs and traditions that every African country has. So, as part of my efforts to discourage the various statements and comments, I preferred to spend a lot of time by myself. I found it very hard to make friends who I didn't teach geography to, or even friends that I did that I or even explain to my friends that I didn't, that camels didn't actually drop me off at school because they didn't, they did not. What I didn't realize with this approach is that I was taking on the selfishness and ignorance that I had found and also becoming part of the problem. Soon enough, I realized that if I began allowing other individuals to fully immerse themselves in learning about my culture, I would break the cultural narratives that surrounded my culture. So I started to question their ideas and perspectives. For instance, if someone speaks about a certain topic that triggers discomfort in me, I looked for why they believed what they did. This created an opportunity for me to learn about their beliefs, their perspectives, and their experiences. It was with this approach that I understood why my peers questioned my decision to own an iPhone, which is very expensive, instead of building a house in my neighborhood back in Africa. So today, I stand before you all to encourage your cultural competence. Instead of making assumptive statements such as, do you speak African? An open-ended question such as, I have heard of the 2,000 languages spoken in Africa, which language do you speak? Will allow our prior knowledge to be resourceful and not a restraint. Alternatively, finding a common ground and acknowledging what we don't know can increase our knowledge of different cultures, which I think is beneficial to all. Eventually, we will realize that this is a valuable tool in our careers, relationships, and our lives in general. I believe that cultural competence isn't a skill that is mastered in a specific way, because we will always meet new people who will bring new cultures, family histories, and worldviews to the table. But simply, the heart that is willing to share our own culture and learn about the cultures of others. Soon enough, we will actually develop diverse leadership, and then we will realize that no one is actually doing anything wrong. No one is actually dressing inappropriately or even walking and speaking differently. Perhaps we will then have a common agreement that wearing hair in dreadlocks, carrying body art, and multiple piercing is not a threat to the community or even the workforce area. Or that homosexuality does not equate HIV AIDS. And maybe then a black man in America will walk freely and comfortable, not scared of anything. When we make a special effort to understand the people that we meet, our lives and our relationships are richer for it. 
Because to us, it is not like that until you actually live there. Thank you.